Welcome, everybody. Our next panel will be introduced by Chris Howard. <laughs> by Chris Howard, who is Executive Vice President and also Chief Operating Officer at Arizona State University. And Chris also leads a lot of the exciting things that are happening related to ASU's work on security issues. So please welcome, thanks. Everybody, please welcome our uh, Chris Howard and our next panel. Thanks so much. This is great. Nobody's listening to me because there's coffee. This is great. Uh, I'm Chris Sauer, Chief Operating Officer, Executive Vice President of Arizona State University, and uh, bring you greetings from Tempe and Phoenix and Scottsdale. And I assure you one thing, it's a dry heat. It's not as hot as you think it is. It's a dry heat. On a more serious note, reflecting on some things that my colleague Jim O'Brien said and my friend Anne-Marie Slaughter said, um, challenges out there and how we can partner to get things right. So W.B. Du Bois, the great uh, black uh, philosopher, wrote in the book, The Soul of Black Folk, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of race. I would posture, posit that the problem of the 21st century is the problem of China. And ladies and gentlemen, New America and Arizona State University are in the problem-solving business. In fact, our charter, which A. Marie quoted, uh, talks about how we're going to judge ourselves by whom we include in their outcomes. But there's another part that mentions that we're going to take fundamental responsibilities for the problems that our society faces. One of those challenges, of course, is China. So when Taiwan Semiconductor decides to come to Phoenix and um, sick, with a, with a um, war chest of $65 billion between tax credit and investments, et cetera, and they need a workforce from PhD to uh, technicians, they partner with Arizona State University. Uh, when the uh, Luke Air Force Base um, fighter wing, uh, led by my friend uh, call sign Ox, says that China is not just near peer, but real peer, and we have to think about innovation. They come to Arizona State University with AFWORK, United States Air Force, and we go to Thunderbird School of Global Management, which is part of ASU, and we create an innovation degree for airmen and guardians so they can learn innovation at the master's degree level. Um, when um, the military, the Southwest Military, uh, sorry, Southwest Military Accelerators create it, with the help of people like uh, Doug Beck from the Defense uh, Innovation Unit and the National Security Innovation Network, and they want to partner in the university, they come to Arizona State University. And then Arizona, student, st Arizona State University in and of itself mobilizes its resources, everything from our flagship Chinese language program to our competitive statecraft initiative, our s and Plus initiative, you're gonna hear about, as I like to say, we were AUKUS before AUKUS was AUKUS. Um, we circle the wagons, we take our resources, our great s and including just winning the DEF CON competition in Las Vegas, $2 million around cyber security and, and cyber, uh, cyber operations. We rally our resources as a great new American university, a fifth wave university, a national service university to solve the challenges and problems. We go to China and meet with Ambassador Nick Burns. We, we meet with members of public diplomacy. So we're very proud to be a part of the solution. So as my panelists come, my fellow, uh, as the panelists come out, I would say that um, we're not gonna solve this alone. That's why our partner in New America is so important. I'm excited to bring in my colleague, Matt Spence. Matt has a distinguished career um, in the Pentagon and, and venture capital, and also is a professor of everything ASU. If you look at his bio, I think he has more titles than, than Michael Crow does. And um, Dimitri, who also uh, has written a wonderful book, um, Alper uh, Alperovich. Am I getting close? You got it. Okay, right, thank you very much. I get a free book. And by the way, he just did a book. He's a founder of CrowdStrike and a wonderful thinker and, and, and innovator in his own right. But he's written a book called World on the Brink. And there are copies out there for him to sign. And he's delighted to be able to do that for you. So without further ado, um, Alex and Matt, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chris, for the invitation to do this and for Anne Marie and Jim for being such wonderful hosts of this. Um, it's really a privilege to talk with Dimitri, where we have known each other quite a while, have been debating about all things 
geopolitics, cybersecurity, venture capital, and how the intersection of geopolitics and technology come together. And there really is no one better poised to talk about this than Dimitri. Uh, the book is fantastic. I don't just say this because I read it in early draft form in a great Microsoft Word document. It will be on sale, and Dimitri will be signing copies here. But digging right in, Dimitri, is you make a number of really thoughtful and bold claims. One in the book, you say that we are in the middle of a Cold War with China. Tell us why. Well, you know, when I started writing the book, I, and I've been convinced for a long time that we're in a Cold War, but I thought this was a different Cold War from the first one. And there's a lot of history in the book, both of China, of Taiwan, uh, but also of the first Cold War that uh, I had uh, the opportunity to live through on the other side, having been born in Russia. And I've been shocked going through the history how similar the two conflicts are. And in fact, now looking back, it's kind of shocking to me that anyone would even claim that we're in anything but a Cold War, right? Let me run you through a litany of similarities. First of all, we have a global competition for supremacy with China playing out in every single corner of the world, right? not just in, in, in the region, playing out in the military sphere, in the diplomatic sphere, technology sphere, geopolitics, um, economic, et cetera. We have an arms race. They're building up their military. We are now building up our forces in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, that uh, arms race is both conventional and nuclear. China is building up massively its nuclear arsenal, trying to match our numbers by the mid-2030s. We're going through uh, of course, uh, modernization of our own nuclear arsenal. We have a regional flashpoint. I argue that Taiwan is the new West Berlin. For the first 15 years of the uh, first Cold War, uh, we uh, had uh, an incredible high risk of going to war with the Soviet Union, including nuclear war, over West Berlin, right? Beginning with the um, Berlin airlift, of course, in the 40s, continuing through the 1961 Berlin crisis. Um, and then a full-on Cuban Missile Crisis that was an outgrowth of the Berlin Crisis. You have economic warfare, export um, controls and, and sanctions and the like. You have a technological race. You have a spy war going on. The FBI says that we have more uh, spying taking place against our country from China today than at any point in the Cold War from, from the Soviet Union. Uh, you have a race and scramble for military bases in the region, both from us, as we're beefing up our, our presence in Japan, obviously in our territory in Guam, uh, going for the first time into the Philippines, and uh, for the first time in 32 years, I should say, and, and getting access to their bases. The Chinese are doing the same thing in Cambodia and Pakistan and other places in the region. So you look at that, and by the way, we have a space race, right? The defining moment of the first Cold War was the race to the moon. What do we do now? Trying to get to the moon before the Chinese do. It's just remarkable on every level. And the only counter to all of these litany of comparisons is, well, we have this deep economic interrelationship right. with China. And I just fundamentally don't understand we have 10 reasons on one side why it's similar and one on well, the let's, other how that. Let's probe into that economic yeah. side. I mean, as you said, that is the important counter. I mean, compared to the Soviet Union, you know, the debates with the Soviet Union were about grain exports to the extent we had some of these economic uncertainty, or the jackson Vanek Amendment and these other pieces that happened in the 70s. We do have a fair amount of economic integration with that. I mean, you can argue that China is a large bondholder of the United States, so that's a piece. But China also, it is an amazing market. You did not have Tim Cook going to the Soviet Union trying to talk about manufacturing key parts of what we have in our pockets. So maybe the numbers don't line up, but how do you think about the economic integration with China that relates to your argument? Well, it's, of course, massively bigger than it ever was with the Soviet Union. But by the way, in the Soviet Union, we had deep economic connections, right? Armand Ham Hammer went to the Soviet Union in the 20s and 30s, set up all kinds of factories there. Uh, we had oil uh, deals with the Soviet Union. We were selling oil technologies to them uh, to, uh, uh, to help them extract natural resources. They were, of course, financing their whole arms race, right? In the 70s and 80s, we were trying to stop, the US government was trying to stop Wall Street and Fleet Street and others from financing Warsaw Pact countries' debt in order to, uh, to help them sustain, sustain their economies, right? So there were deep connections. Pepsi, I remember drinking Pepsi in the Soviet Union because Coca-Cola was not there, but Pepsi was. So um, th there, was, there were always connections with the Soviet Union that I think people have forgotten now, that you were not completely disconnected blocks, much, much greater level with China today, but by the way, it is being reversed as we speak, right? As we are de-risking, decoupling, you, you pick your term that you like, um, a foreign direct investment in China dropped 20% year over year uh, this year, right? Um, companies are 
either um, stalling their, their growth and expansion in China or, or decreasing it altogether. And uh, by the way, the Chinese are also uh, doing the same thing and trying to focus on Made in China 2025 20, uh, and make it much more difficult for US companies to operate. So a lot of that integration that we've had is being reversed. Now, scale is still massive, no question about it. But by the way, if you look at the trade that we have with China, one of the top imports we have from China, does anyone have any clue what it is? Toys. You know, not exactly the most strategic. So there's, uh, there's other things as well, but uh, when you start looking at the actual numbers of what we import from China, um, you know. It's changed quite it, a bit. It's changing quite a lot, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting, I mean, as you talk about those intersections, you, you said that, you know, Taiwan is a new West Berlin. That has a lot of different dimensions. The argument about West Berlin, of course, is are you willing to trade American lives for Berlin? You know, that was a key part of our NATO commitment. Is it actually credible? Um, just to be provocative, why is Taiwan worth American lives dying for? It's a great question, and, and this is really what I argue in the book, is that this is, we've forgotten now how essential Taiwan has always been to American interests, uh, really for 150 years since we've been deeply involved in that region. General Douglas MacArthur in 1950 said Taiwan is an unsink, or Formosa is, is called at the time, is the unsinkable aircraft carrier. 1950, right, long before chips, long before the dawn of the age of computing, it was that vital. And when you look at the map of that region, Taiwan is really the cork that keeps China bottled up. You know, China complains a lot that we're trying to contain them. And they're absolutely right. We are. We're not willing to admit it, but we are absolutely are interested in containing them geographically and, and strategically. And when China looks out at the world, and this is why, by the way, it wants Taiwan, it sees itself completely surrounded by U.S. allies and U.S. military bases, right? From the very far east, you have the Korean Peninsula, half of which is South Korea, U.S. Army, uh, some naval bases, uh, some air bases there, right? Further down, the Japanese islands, headquarters of the Seventh Fleet, Marines in Okinawa. Then in the very center of the Taiwan Strait, the, the uh, sort of anchor point of the first island chain, Taiwan, viewed as an outpost of American power, even though we don't have significant troops there. And then closing the arc, the Philippines, where we're once again uh, establishing a very deep uh, military relationship there. So if you're China and you think that you're re-emerging on the world stage and reasserting your rightful place as the top power, top superpower economically, militarily, and so forth, which they think is their rightful place to be because for much of human history they were that, right? Up until the Industrial Revolution, they were the most populous, the richest, most powerful country on the planet. They think that it's their right to do so and Xi Jinping wants to accomplish it um, in this century and you know, potentially by 2049, the 100th anniversary of the PRC. And you can't do that if you're surrounded by another power, America, that can essentially blockade you, uh, both in the Strait of Malacca uh, and, uh, and uh, in East, uh, China Sea as well. Uh, and you are highly dependent on both imports and exports for your economy, right? So taking Taiwan would enable them to break out of that containment, dominate East Asia, push us out, endanger our supply routes to Japan, to the Philippines, to Korea, and, and really establish themselves as a hegemon in that region first and foremost, and the, then use it as a springboard to uh, establish a blue water navy that traverses the world's oceans and does essentially what we did, the US Navy did, uh, from the uh, late 1890s um, and early 1900s. So for those same reasons that they want it, I think we can't have them, uh, we can't let them have it. Uh, because it will change the nature of American power. I think it will mark the end of American superpower and the end of the American century. Yes, you have the importance of chips. Taiwan produces, as everyone all knows, 90% of the world's chips. What's even more important that's not often talked about is that Taiwan produces actually 40% of all chips, not just advanced. Um, uh, but, you know, I don't want to make an argument that we should go to war over chips. It's hard to tell anyone to go die for chips. Uh, but for... Um, uh, maintaining American hegemony and uh, American superiority in the century and not letting another rival power, particularly an authoritarian no, religion I mean, like China, yeah. emerge, uh, I think is, is worth fighting for. I mean, so, I mean, you know, you said what is worth fighting for, and I think it's a, you argue extensively here. I want to bring in another interesting part of your book is one thing I found very compelling is you bring in the geopolitical landscape together. And let's bring in the other piece where the question is, what is worth fighting for Ukraine? So you have uh, a lot of foresight in talking about Ukraine. I remember we talked about this for a while. You were pretty early in predicting Russia's aggression 
in Ukraine, both on Twitter, in your writing. Now, the United States, of course, uh, was able to get ahead of what Russia was trying to argue through false flag and other operations. But you really had this pretty early on, uh, which a lot of foreign policy prognosticators can't say. Reflecting now, what did you get right about Russia and Ukraine, and what did you get wrong? Well, I would say I got right that he was going to do it, and I, I became convinced in late November, early December, came out publicly, said he's going to do this before the end of that winter. I was one of the only voices at the time saying this. Um, uh, took a lot of heat for it. Uh, what I got wrong, and what I think many got wrong, is that I thought he would succeed. Um, now, mo why, why did you think that? Uh, just overwhelming power and, and the dysfunction and unpreparedness, honestly, on, on the part of Ukraine. Uh, they weren't mobilizing. They weren't uh, um, pulling people out of barracks until the very last moment, literally hours before the missiles hit, that a lot of things started shifting, uh, which I thought, you know, in the lead up to this, being convinced that this was happening, I thought was uh, really um, a, a huge mistake. Uh, but what I think most people don't realize is how close it came. And you know, I was in Kiev uh, talking to their general staff, uh, looking at the early stages of the war. And the key to the Russian plan, which was not a terrible plan, by the way. Everyone sort of criticized it in, in retrospect because it was a failure. But it was the same plan, effectively, that they had in 1979 with the invasion of Afghanistan, which at the initial stage did work. They overthrew the regime. The insurgency didn't work out. Um, but we have some experience with that, too. Um, and then uh, basically uh, identical to the Prague operation, uh, in Czechoslovakia in the 60s as well. And, and the plan was flying airborne forces into Hasmal Airport right outside of Kiev, drive into Kiev, enforce, capture or kill Zelensky, and then as that is happening, you, you flow forces in, you know, the country is decapitated and, and it's much easier for the military to establish control, right? That first part, of course, was a failure, but it came so close. What most people don't appreciate is it came close because low-level commanders in the Ukrainian military, without orders, took it upon themselves to destroy the runways and the Russians couldn't land. And once that failed, um, they didn't have a plan B, right? And they tried to get um, to Kiev on, through land. That took four or five days. You remember the long column of vehicles uh, from Belarus, and it was too late at that point, right? There were defenses that were built up, and, and uh, the whole thing failed. So it wasn't that the, uh, the plan was a bad one. It was that, that there was no plan B. Once you fail to capture Hostomo, the critical objective, everything kind of fall, falls down from there. Uh, but if they had captured it, and if they had managed to get to Kiev and potentially, you know, kill or capture Zelensky, we would be sitting talking about a whole different very situation different, right now. Very different question. Uh, there is an enormous amount of expertise in this room, just looking around as well as online. Uh, if you have questions, uh, let us know. We'll we'll take them after my my next question. But as you talk about uh, Dimitri, maybe bringing these two conflicts together. So you talked about Taiwan, you know Ukraine well. How should we think about these conflicts together as part of the geopolitical developments going on right now? How are China and Ukraine related right now? So I started writing the book right after the war broke out. And I, as I was doing the retrospective of how I got convinced that he was going to invade Ukraine, I distilled it into five key factors that I think drove him uh, to make that decision. And as I look at the Indo-Pacific, as I look at Xi, um, all those same factors are driving him, I believe, to, to want to invade Taiwan. And the factors are, 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 are such. First of all, uh, a distorted view of history, right? Both men have this view that these places, Ukraine and, and Taiwan, um, are not independent nations. Um, you know, she obviously makes the argument that Taiwan does not belong to China, or belongs to China. Uh, as I write in the book, that is actually ahistorical. There's never been a single moment in Taiwanese history when whoever fully controlled China also controlled Taiwan. And we know that Putin doesn't think that Ukraine uh, deserves to be an independent state. Secondly, um, destiny. Both men believe it is their country's destiny and their personal destinies to accomplish these tasks, right, to dominate Ukraine in the case of Putin, to accomplish the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, as she calls it, and take Taiwan. Um, there's a security and geographic component to this as well. Um, we tend to um, not focus on it as much. I already mentioned why Taiwan is so important to both uh, Chinese security, 
i.e. escaping containment, but also for projecting power across the Western Pacific, um, uh, which they'll be able to do if they escape that containment and establish uh, naval bases on the other side, on the um, uh, eastern side of Taiwan. Uh, Ukraine is also really important to Russia, has always been. Uh, it's been viewed as a critical buffer state to stop uh, foreign invasions of Russian territory, of which there have been obviously numerous, from Hitler, Napoleon, Teutonic Knights, Polish invasions, etc. cetera. Uh, it gave them time to mobilize forces as these invading forces were driving on Moscow. And by the way, we've seen just last year how small those distances are, right? Uh, Wagner uh, and Prigozhin um, left their training camps in eastern Ukraine and without, within about eight hours were within uh, an hour or two outside of Moscow, right? So the distances are short. And, um, and then from an offensive perspective, if you want to dominate uh, uh, Eastern Europe, um, you have to go through Ukraine, right? So it gives you a, a critical- it's Similar to your island chain. Yeah, and, and the last piece that is really vital is ego of those two men, right? Both of them right now are 71. Um, both of them are looking at the twilights of their hold on power, their careers, um, next decade or so. And uh, both of them are uh, focused on the legacy, going down in the history books. We know with Xi, he's obsessed of, with eclipsing Mao's destiny, right? Accomplishing the one thing that Mao could never do, which is take Taiwan. We know that Putin talks a lot about being Peter the Great and rejuvenating the, the great Russian empire. So this is the problem, that you've got strategic reasons for why they want to have these countries. Uh, and uh, there are personal reasons as well that are driving them. And the timeline is really key, right? Putin didn't want to wait because he was looking at how long he wants to stay in power. And I think he was probably, uh, if the war hadn't happened, he probably would have stepped aside and orchestrated a transition earlier. But now he can't. He's in it for life. Um, and she's looking at probably the next um, eight to 10 years, um, potentially with his own longevity and, and his own hold on power. Uh, during which he, he can accomplish this, right? And, and for Xi, there are really two driving factors here. One is the capabilities, and we know that the Chinese military is modernizing, they're focused on, on, on trying to build capabilities to take Taiwan, everything from sea lift, anti-submarine warfare, uh, missile arsenals, everything else. Uh, Director Burns talks about him giving the order of the, to the PLA to be ready by 2027. And the second timeline is the legacy timeline, right? The clock is ticking for him personally, to accomplish this on his watch. So on, as, as you talk about legacy, uh, and as we wrap up in the last few minutes, let's take a step further back. So we will have uh, a new president of the United States uh, uh, selected in uh, just 60 days. Elected. Uh, in that 60, if the new president approaches you uh, and enlists you to become his or her national security advisor, what are the first things that you would do in that role? I think you have to relook at all of our strategic engagements around the world, right? One of the reasons why I argue passionately that we're in a cold war with China is not just to, to put a label on this conflict that we have, but because that label allows us to have a deep level of focus and prioritization that has been lacking uh, for th the last 30 years in our foreign policy, right? For good or, or, or not, during the first Cold War, everything was looked at through the lens of this confrontation with the Soviet Union. Now, it has led us into some mistakes, you know, Vietnam most notably, um, including you know, various coups in Latin America, Iran, et cetera. So it was not always for the better. But by and large, I think when you look at the totality of the actions that we had undertaken to confront the Soviet Union in every corner of the world, um, it worked out, obviously. We won the Cold War. We're missing that in this confrontation with China. And I actually argue that we should not shy away from the Cold War label, one, because it's true, but two, because we actually have a pretty good track record of winning Cold Wars. And I would actually argue that China is a much, much weaker power in every sense except economic than the Soviet Union. It does not have the alliance network, the Warsaw Pact that the Soviet Union had. It does not have the landmass. It does not have the, uh, the naval power that the Soviet Union had. It does not have the ideological appeal. On every level, it's weaker. So. Uh, we should not be shying away from, from uh, this confrontation with the Cold War. And by the way, I prefer a Cold War to a hot one. Um, but the, 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 the second element of this is that that focus that we had during the first Cold War needs to be applied to China because it will take a lot of resources for us um, uh, to win this Cold War. I think we have all the advantages vis-a-vis -vis them. 
but uh, it's, it will still take effort. And the more that we're distracted around the world, uh, the you know, less we're going to be able to, to, har uh, to marshal those resources in a conversation with China. That is not an argument, by the way, to pull out and not support Ukraine or completely pull out of the Middle East or, or, or elsewhere, as some are making. But it is uh, about asking the hard questions. Is this deterring? Uh, uh, is, is this conflict that we're engaged in or the support uh, preventing us from, from acting vis-a-vis -vis China? Or is it enhancing that, right? And to the extent that it is preventing it, again, it's not that it's a black and white decision and we should just abandon those entanglements, but we should be asking, should we scale it down? Should we ask our allies and others to step in, right? You know, when you look at Ukraine, for example, I've, um, you know, uh, I'm engaged with the Ukrainians on an almost daily basis in various capacities. I'm uh, firmly believing, uh, I'm firm believer that we should support them, but it's also indisputable that some of the capabilities we're providing to Ukraine, not all, not even most, are taking away from our ability to, to defend Taiwan, primarily in the area of air defense, right? And, and it's hard because air defense is actually the, the thing that they need the most, as they've been talking about Russian missiles and drones, but this is where we have to get the Europeans to really step up, right? Well, and, 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 and say, you know, we're gonna need a lot of those capabilities in the Pacific. You gotta provide them as much as you can. Well, it's, uh, it's a, been a fascinating overview. Um, as, as we wrap up, I take away three very interesting things from this. I think first, there's some historical analogies that we can learn from and think about how people and these conflicts are coming together. Uh, second, we need to think about things from a grand strategic level. Uh, but third, I think really implied in a lot of what you said is we do have the assets and we do have what it takes to win here. It is really thinking about how to knit these pieces together. Uh, I hope everyone will join me in thanking Dimitri for what has been really a fascinating tour de force of foreign policy. Thank you. As I mentioned again, it, it really is. I mean, you can do these things and say, it's a great book, having not read it. I have actually read it. Uh, we've talked about it a lot. It is out here, and like I said, Dimitri has generously agreed to stay and sign some copies. For those of you who haven't read, uh, would encourage you to. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Appreciate it.